Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, Fire and Life Safety, Notification and Communication Systems, sponsored by Edwards. I'm your moderator, Amara Rausgis, with Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media. To ensure the best webcast experience, here are some tips. If you are having trouble with your slides or with the sound, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's photo. You can control the volume settings by adjusting the volume on your own computer. If you are having technical problems, please click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to bring up a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box and someone will respond as soon as possible in the Answered Questions box. Type questions for today's expert presenters in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. You may ask questions at any time during the presentation, and the Q&A portion will start after the prepared presentation, so that will be in about 45 minutes. If you're on Twitter, tweet your questions to us at hashtag CSE Fire Notification. Today's webcast is being recorded, and you will receive an email with the link to the archive in about a week. To download the presentation slides, use Event Resources on the left side of your screen. For those of you who are interested in receiving one AIA CES approved learning unit or one AIA CES health, safety, and welfare unit for this event, you need to pass a 10 question exam. To take the learning unit exam and download your AIA CES certificate, use the learning unit exam tab at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a new browser window so if you do want to take the exam after we're all done, I suggest you open a new tab now because the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website with the archived version of this webcast. In keeping with the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education System Policy, please take some time to read the Quality Assurance slide. Here's a list of the learning objectives for today's webcast. We'll touch on these in today's presentation. Please note that any blue underlined text you see in today's presentation is a hyperlink to a reference or resource to help guide you to more information. Now we'll hear a word from today's sponsor. At the conclusion of the commercial, you may experience a few seconds of silence to make up for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned after the video for today's presentation. The worst thing that can happen is people don't believe their smoke detectors when they alarm. We've all had it happen where we're burning toast, or we burn bacon, and the detectors go off. They're making a lot of noise and people get annoyed by that. The hamburgers are put into the broiler. Broiler's turned on high heat, uh, produces smoke that our detectors must not alarm to. Then a second part of the test is they actually ignite a piece of polyurethane foam that then produces real smoke, not nuisance smoke, where our detectors must then alarm before a certain level. The biggest goal is that people get notified that there's a fire with enough time to evacuate, to get out call for help. So it's extremely important that when the detectors alarm, people know it's a real fire. I would like to introduce today's presenters. Ray Grill is a principal at Arup and a licensed professional engineer in many states. He is a member of several NFPA committees, including NFPA 13, 72, and 101, 
and he is the chair of both the NFPA 13 and 101 committees. He's also a member of the ICC General Code Committee. He's a rock star fire protection engineer, and you've probably seen him speak or otherwise present. Bill Koffel is president of Koffel Associates and is a licensed professional engineer in several states. He is a member of the NFPA 13, 25, 72, and 101 committees and is the chair of NFPA 25. Bill is a world-renowned fire protection expert and he has also presented at several events and conferences. Both Ray and Bill are members of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. It's my pleasure to work with the two of the best in the industry. Ray, you're the first expert presenter today, so let's begin. Thank you for that kind introduction, uh, Amar. It's a pleasure to be here today to talk to everybody about fire alarm and notification and communication systems. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, first talk about what drives fire alarm requirements. So sometimes there's a little confusion in, uh, in the, in the uh, community as to you know, what the drivers for fire alarm requirements are. And the main drivers are building and fire codes. So the International Building Code, the International Fire Code, NFPA 1, NFPA 101, they all have requirements for fire alarm systems for notification of occupants. And there are also other standards that can drive the requirement for occupant notification or fire alarm requirements in general. Uh, some of those might be you know, NFPA 75, which is data processing centers, NFPA 76, telecommunications, and there's other specialty standards that might come into play. There's also uh, other requirements in, in other standards that may address other types of hazards, such as uh, special, special hazard protection or special suppression systems. There are requirements for notifying the occupants within those areas where those systems are installed. And then we also have the potential for owner or insurance criteria that may drive notification. Now, when we talk about notification and we talk about how those systems are to be installed, we generally defer to NFPA 72 and the model building codes and most insurance criteria will also reference NFPA 72. So NFPA 72 in and of itself does not require a fire alarm system to be installed or any specific aspects of notification or emergency communication. But it, when those systems are required to be installed, they are generally required to be installed in accordance with the installation location performance requirements that are identified in NFPA 72. So NFPA 72 does not require a firearm system, but when they are required, it provides the criteria for how those systems are to be installed and designed, as well as maintained. So the primary purpose of NFPA 72 is to address the uh, the manner in which the system performs, how it transmits signals, uh, how notification is, is placed so that occupants are appropriately notified or emergency responders are appropriately notified. So it does address enunciation and levels of performance. Okay. Also within the purpose of NFPA 72, uh, it works in tandem with it, the building code. So uh, what we are seeing more of is more specific requirements sometimes being placed in the building code relative to a fire alarm requirement. In cases where there are conflicting requirements, generally the building code that's been adopted in the jurisdiction would take precedent. So uh, just to uh, reinforce the, the concept, NFPA 72 provides the how-to when other building codes or uh, documents require a fire alarm system to be installed within a building or facility. Here's examples of uh, some of the documents. Uh, the requirements in the building codes generally are driven by either life safety risk or uh, in some cases by property protection. So the building codes generally are focused on uh, a property not exposing their neighbors. So sometimes it's important uh, that the uh, fire alarm system uh, provide notification to minimize the potential for fire spread to adjacent properties as well. 
Now, in almost all cases where a sprinkler system is installed, there will be a requirement for a fire alarm system to at least supervise the sprinkler system, the suppression system, and to send signals off-site. There are some exceptions where we have uh, very limited uh, size sprinkler uh, systems, but uh, in general, uh, almost all uh, fire alarm, uh, almost all sprinkler systems are required to be monitored by fire alarm uh, by the model codes. Now, while requiring supervision, these sprinkler systems do not necessarily drive occupant notification within the building. That's driven by other requirements within the building codes. So, for example, those requirements are typically occupancy driven. So, for instance, uh, in assembly occupancies where you have an occupant load in excess of 300 people, there are requirements for uh, manual activation of notification or water flow activation of notification. When we get into assembly occupancies that are over a thousand people under uh, the IBC, we have a requirement for emergency voice communication systems to be provided. When we're dealing with business occupancies, if we have an occupant load greater than 500 for the entire building or greater than 100 on any floor above the lowest level of exit discharge, we would have a requirement for either manual activation or water flow activation of the notification systems within the building. So we would then have a notification system in those buildings. Ambulatory care facilities are another occupancy. So these are typically facilities where uh, the occupants uh, are uh, incapacitated for uh, limited periods of time. Uh, we do have requirements for detection uh, as well as uh, sprinklers, uh, uh, sprinkler flow to uh, initiate notification. Educational occupancies. Uh, this is, uh, these requirements have changed a little bit over uh, the last few cycles of the building code, but uh, in general, we have a requirement for uh, manual uh, activation of uh, notification, uh, as well as a requirement that's come into the code for emergency voice alarm communication system. So again, we have uh, speakers. Now, the one thing that has changed in 72 uh, over the last few cycles, uh, I think this change was made in the 2010 edition, uh, or actually in the IBC, uh, the allowance that an emergency voice alarm communication system can be utilized to communicate other emergency messages. So within a K through 12 facility, if that voice system is designed uh, appropriately to notify occupants, it can be used for not only just fire evacuation, but also for other emergency messaging. And in fact, for industrial buildings, uh, depending on the size of the building and the number of occupants, again, we have uh, requirements for fire alarm uh, and notification when we're exceeding uh, two stories or exceeding one story rather with uh, and having occupant loads greater than 500 uh, above the floor of the uh, lowest level of exit discharge. Okay. Now hazardous occupancies, so group H occupancies, these are occupancies with uh, either uh, toxic or uh, corrosive chemicals uh, that exceed uh, minimal limits within the building codes or flammable uh, liquids, um, and in some cases, uh, high piled storage. Uh, we have requirements for notification and fire alarm systems, uh, as well as potential uh, requirements for smoke detection when we have toxic gases within those facilities. Now, I occupancies cover both hospitals uh, as well as um, detention facilities and also uh, daycare facilities. So we might have requirements for those uh, facilities for occupant notification as well. And it's important to understand what type of occupancy within the I category uh, you're designing to, to make sure the features are appropriate. Okay. Mercantile occupancies, again, uh, unless we are over 500 people in an overall building or having more than 100 people on a floor above or below the lowest level of exit discharge, uh, we would be driven to provide notification uh, within those facilities. Finally, uh, residential occupancy. So within hotels, uh, which is a transient residential, we would have a requirement for occupant notification, and that would be activated by um, potentially manual means or water flow, uh, as well as by smoke detection within the corridor. 
and then apartment buildings, which are handled a little bit differently because of the nature of the occupancy, because people are familiar with their uh, surroundings and buildings. Uh, we do not have uh, smoke detection in the in the corridors themselves required, but we do have a requirement for notification based on either manual activation or water flow detection. And uh, certainly within each of these units, we would have local notification if you had a smoke alarm or smoke detector activate within the unit itself. So those devices within the units are not required to activate the building fire alarm system. Finally, uh, other factors, uh, height of the building, high-rise buildings, for instance, can uh, that would drive some specific requirements for notification and emergency communication. So uh, high-rise building uh, emergency voice alarm communication is required. Uh, in most jurisdictions now, in-building two-way radio enhancement systems are uh, the uh, general requirement with the allowance for two-way hardwired systems when approved by the authority having jurisdiction. Now, the other thing that can drive fire alarm system requirements and sometimes notification is other uh, fire safety control functions. So for instance, if we have smoke control, we would have requirements that are associated with controlling and uh, activating the smoke control system. We have a general requirement that's driven through the mechanical codes for HVAC shutdown when our systems serve multiple smoke compartments or when they're over a minimum size. We will have elevator recall required in, in any building basically that has fire service uh, functions on their elevator. And in new construction, every uh, elevator that serves more than one story is required to have fire service uh, features. So uh, we would have elevator recall driving a fire alarm system. And then if we have other special features that we may have designed into our building, such as uh, wanting to hold doors open for to facilitate circulation, we, we might have door release service that uh, would potentially uh, be uh, driving a fire alarm system and, and certainly fire alarm features. So when is an emergency communication system you know, basically required? So we talked about all the various fire alarm systems. Now, again, just to reiterate some of those, when we, there are different types of emergency communication systems uh, addressed, uh, particularly within NFPA 72. So you know, within our high-rise buildings, we have our uh, emergency, our one-way voice emergency communication. We have our, our two-way system for firefighter service. We might have area of refuge two-way communication, which doesn't necessarily mean you have a physical area of refuge, but even in that case where you do not have a physical area of refuge, the building codes require two-way communication from elevator lobbies. We have two-way communication within the elevator car itself to allow for uh, the event of uh, someone being stranded within an elevator car, being able to communicate with a center, a supervising station to request assistance. And we also, in our high occupant load assembly occupancies, would be providing an emergency alarm voice communication system. Now, we often get the question, you know, when is mass notification required? Well, mass notification came into NFPA 72 in the 2010 edition into the body of the code. And uh, to this day, the only uh, actual requirement for mass notification is through the uh, Department of Defense uh, Corps of Engineers uh, projects uh, that are applying uh, the UFCs, the Unified Facility Criteria. And uh, the General Service Administration also includes the requirement that the fire alarm system be designed with the capability to provide uh, messaging for other than fire emergencies, but it does not take it to the extent of requiring a full-blown or a full-blown mass notification system. Now, the other requirement that is coming into the codes is uh, that there be a analysis of particular types of occupancies when uh, those buildings are being designed to 
uh, evaluate whether a mass notification system should be provided. And this is being driven by NFPA 101 and the IBC. So let's take a look at some of those. So in the 2018 edition of NFPA 101, there are now requirements that a risk analysis be performed to determine whether a mass notification system uh, will be, is required within a facility. So if you have a new high-rise building that's over 420 feet in height or having more than 5,000 occupants, that type of building would require, under the 2018 edition of 101, a risk analysis new assembly occupancies with 500 or more occupants, new educational occupancies. So, key, and, uh, so that's basically pretty broad, right? So that's uh, typically K through 12. Um, and within K through 12 and college and university dormitories, uh, you would require a risk analysis to determine whether mass notification is required. New mall structures. So a mall building is defined by the code uh, those structures are required to have a mass notification system. And then business occupancies with the classroom that is owned or rented by a university would also be required to have a mass not uh, a risk analysis performed. So prior to, um, so within the IBC, the 2018 edition, there's also a requirement added that a risk analysis be provided for uh, new construction on a university or college campus with a cumulative occupant load exceeding 1,000. Okay, so, uh, and it does reference you back to NFPA 72 for that risk analysis criteria. So why is the risk analysis required? So the main reason is that the code developers, which you know includes us, um, you know we recognize that emergency communications have to be designed for the specific facility and hazards. It's not like fire. Fire burns the same in almost all different buildings, right? Uh, we know how fire spreads based on combustible loads, but the different hazards that can be present in a building may drive a different uh, uh, requirement for who needs to be communicated with, what those messages may need to be, uh, things of that nature. Now, the emergency communication system also needs to be designed so that it is it works with the emergency response plan for a facility. So prescriptive requirements really can't address all the situations that uh, may, may be appropriate for uh, the design of that mass notification system. So in NFPA 72, it talks about what a risk analysis is. And the, the thing that uh, is uh, sometimes challenging is determining you know, how deep does the risk analysis need to go. Uh, so you know, within the definition, you know, it's a process uh, uh, of evaluating uh, the likelihood and vulnerability and magnitude of incidents associated with you know, natural, technological, man-made disasters and other emergencies that can impact the facility. Okay, so uh, the other uh, thing that we, we have done in the uh, emergency communication systems chapter of 72 is provide additional language to tie the MNS design uh, more directly to the emergency response plan in, um, because that can drive what the uh, performance of that system needs to be. So here are some uh, specific criteria that's been added to NFA 72. Uh, you know, the detail and complexity of the risk analysis shall be commensurate with the complexity of the facility for which you're designing your mass notification. So the point there being is that if you've got a simple system, yeah, you might need a, or might need or want. It could be an owner's uh, directive to include mass notification, but it doesn't have to be overly complex. Uh, it depends on the specific situation. And it also, uh, the risk analysis per is permitted explicitly to be limited in scope to address the communication requirements of an existing emergency response plan. So if you have uh, you know, almost all facilities that are of any specific uh, or any size and uh, in function are typically required to have emergency response plans by the fire code that's applicable within that jurisdiction. So those uh, emergency response plans uh, or those facilities may not have emergency communication, but an emergency com communication mass notification system can be implemented while uh, not 
going overboard. Uh, the design can be consistent to address those those needs. So uh, again, it's not specific, uh, not fire specific. Our mass notification design has to address other hazards, right? So it's the hazards that may be present or expected within those facilities. Required occupant response may be different depending on the nature of the event. So that can be done through recorded voice messages. It can be done through a digital uh, voice uh, library within a system. And it can also be done through uh, uh, manual means, manual voice messages with trained personnel. So again, uh, the mass notification system should be specific to the anticipated risk of the facility. Both fire and non-fire emergencies uh, need to be considered from a, a risk tolerance for survivability. Okay, when we're talking about mass notification, survivability of this, that system is driven by the, the risk analysis and what hazards could be present. So if you have uh, a facility that uh, may have uh, a chemical plant, for instance, where if you're worried about a toxic release, uh, you know, the location of the operating consoles uh, may be very important or having redundancy in order to assure that the system can be utilized uh, if there is an event uh, needs to be considered. Okay, so the characteristics of the building and the, um, and the region, uh, regions and operations need to be considered. So uh, take, for example, um, you know, Tornado Alley, uh, you've got uh, specific weather conditions that you're going to want to notify people of. Uh, those are factors that need to be taken into consideration. And then, then a, a review of the extent to which occupants and personnel are notified should also be part of the risk analysis. So other considerations include things like the response team structure, response procedures, notification and communication message content, the you know, authority to communicate, who are you going to allow to actually activate a mass notification system? Typically, you want to control who has access to that equipment because you do not want unwanted activation. You don't want it to be used in a malicious way as well. So there's a lot of considerations that need to come into play. Here's a listing of some of the things from NFA 72 that uh, would need to be considered. The other thing that's important about uh, emergency communication is the issue of intelligibility and making sure that messages are are uh, being uh, presented in a uh, in, uh, in a way that they can be understood, which is really the definition of intelligibility in NFPA 72. So when we're doing uh, intel uh, design, okay, voice messages are are not typically required to meet the audibility requirements of NFPA 72. So when we present a voice message through the system, it is always preceded by alert tones. Those alert tones are what should be measured for determining the code compliant audibility of the system. So if we're doing general notification, uh, public mode, we would typically be designing for 15 dB above ambient. We would measure the alert tones prior to the voice message. We don't measure voice messages for audibility because during the course of a voice message, there is a broad range of sound pressure levels and the equipment will average that those, those uh, various ranges and in, uh, inevitably provide a lower level. So that's actually explicit in NFPA 72. So the main thing what we're getting, what we're uh, designing for is to be able to communicate a clear message that people can understand and that they can act on, okay? Quantifiable measurement is not required within NFPA 72. Now, if you're designing mass notification for uh, the Department of Defense, uh, the UFC does have criteria for quantifiable measurement, but that is the only uh, standard that I'm aware of that actually has any requirement for quantifiable measurement. And in that case, it tells you actually where you need to measure. Now, let's talk about a couple more things. Uh, uh, signaling line circuit limitation. So when we're designing mass notification or co emergency communication, we have to be cognizant of our zoning of those uh, notification zones and the circuiting that we're uh, designing for those. So uh, there was some new criteria that uh, came into the NFPA 72 standard in 2016 
the standard uh, used to allow for up to 50 addressable devices to be uh, lost on a single fault. That has been changed to a single zone only being able to be lost on a single line circuit. And it also indicates in 72 that each floor of a building is required to be treated as its own. So it's uh, quite a different approach uh, as you start applying NFPA 20, uh, the 2016 edition, uh, you need to take this into consideration in your designs. So uh, when we talk about survivability, just to clarify this, it is survivability under NFPA 72 for an emergency communication system is driven by limiting the uh, uh, degradation of the system due to attack by fire. It does not necessarily uh, address any other any other type of hazard. So a mechanical hazard, for instance, if you're providing a mass notification system, you would need to address those types of things under mass notification, but not under an emergency communication system that is only applicable to fire emergencies. And the other uh, point uh, from a fire standpoint, we are only providing or required to provide uh, survivability when we are doing partial evacuation or relocation of occupants. If you're doing total evacuation in a fire scenario, survivability of the notification uh, system is not required. A couple other things, level two. Uh, so level two survivability is the basic requirement for voice evac systems, to a radio enhancement communication systems, to a area of refuge communications. Uh, in the 2016 edition, we'll have a couple, there's been a, a couple of new exceptions that have been uh, added, addressing buildings uh, that are less than two hour construction where circuits are separated based on the size of the compartment, okay? Now, uh, non-voice systems also have a requirement for survivability when you are doing partial evacuation or relocation. So we could do partial evacuation with a, a sounder uh, or horn system, horn for notification. In that case, uh, the standard does not explicitly uh, identify the level of survivability, uh, but uh, so any one of the levels of survivability would be, uh, could be considered acceptable. So uh, again, the survivability is primarily applicable to the notification circuits and communication circuits necessary for the continued operation of the emergency communication system. They're not required for the notification side of the system if it has no impact on the performance of notification. So uh, you know, your smoke detector circuits, water flow circuits, uh, circuits that are only handling initiating devices would not need to be survivable. And the other point is that if you do design your system so that your a circuit uh, does not uh, would not be impacted by a fire and still allow communication to other zones, then uh, that that helps your survivability. So here are the two exceptions, uh, some exceptions that have been added. So level one is allowed where notification zones are separated by less than two hours of construction, or level one is allowed where at least two paths within the compartment are serving the notification devices and they are separated by at least one third of the maximum wall for all diagonal. A third option allows for performance-based design approach. Now with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bill. Well, thank you, Ray. And um, I'm gonna go back to Ray's first slide. And he asked us what the drivers were for a fire alarm system. And he indicated that the primary driver on many projects is going to be the codes. And he's done a great job of walking us through some of those code requirements and the related requirements in the reference standard NFPA 72. But the last bullet on his slide referred to owner and insurance criteria. And that's what I wanna focus on. I wanna encourage us as design professionals and potentially uh, owners, operators, or property management companies to maybe think a little bit beyond the box. I'll admit that many of our clients, the primary focus, the primary objective they have on a project as it relates to fire safety is going to be do what I need to do to comply with the code. But there may be other objectives that they would like to have met and they don't know how to express it or we've never really given them the opportunity to identify those fire safety objectives. Fire safety objectives generally fall within five, one of five or 
potentially five different categories. Ray's already mentioned that the codes pretty well address the life safety objective, uh, whether we're talking a life safety code or a building code or a fire code. Uh, as a former firefighter, other than the rate enhancement system that Ray talked about, I'm not sure there's a lot of consideration given to emergency response personnel, but certainly for the occupants in the building, the residents, the staff that work in the building, the codes offer a pretty, I would say, reasonable level protection of, for their life safety. Ray also mentioned that to a certain extent, building codes address property protection. But I guess I would question whether the building codes necessarily offer the same level of property protection as our client might expect. The code requirements, as Ray walked us through them, they're occupancy driven. But within an occupancy, I could have an area. For example, we see some costly medical equipment in the slide. Maybe there's some additional detection that should be provided in that space, be it to operate an alternate suppression system, or be it simply to provide some detection if there's a fire in this space, in particular hours, time periods after the people might be working in that space. Uh, is it adequate to rely on sprinkler protection? As a consulting company, you know, we have fast response sprinklers in our office space. Code doesn't require smoke detection. We don't have smoke detection. I'm assuming my employees are awake and alert. However, there is an area in our office that we consider needing some additional protection. And yes, you could say it's property protection related, but it's also continuity of operation. And that's our server area. Uh, while we have a backup and we have alternates, you know, if we were to lose the server, there would be some disruption to our ability to provide services to our clients. So codes don't generally talk about built business continuity uh, or continuity of operation. And yet, from an insurance perspective, that's one of the larger segments of payouts that we're seeing in large fire cases is a payout for disruption of the business operation. So again, our owner might be concerned about the continuity of operations. If I have a warehouse and it's the sole supply source for the materials that we're distributing to retail establishments around the country, if I have a significant fire in that warehouse, that could significantly impact the distribution chain for those products and therefore affect my business. Environmental considerations, can be an issue, and we talk, most of the ones on the slide talk about suppression system, but again, there may be a fire alarm aspect in terms of notifying the emergency response personnel if the code doesn't already require it, uh, so that we get faster response to intervene in this incident. There may be uh, a desire to have some additional detection so that hopefully I become aware of the fire before one of these suppression systems even activates. And, and therefore, maybe we can have intervention by an emergency response team at the facility or something along that line. And then lastly, and we've seen some, unfortunately, we've seen some fires recently that have affected some buildings of significant cultural uh, significance. Um, and, you know, many instances, they don't want to take disrupt the property or incur the expense of putting sprinkler protection or some other protection in there. Again, some form of detection versus suppression might be a way to address that objective. So I'm encouraging you as design professionals, I'm encouraging you as owners and operators of facilities to give some thought and basically ask the fundamental question. If I have a fire in this building, what would be an acceptable outcome to that fire? And do those code requirements that Ray talked about address that level of protection? And it's not just the code. So we heard Ray talk about intelligibility. He talked about survivability. And he mentioned that there are some instances where the standard might require intelligibility or might require pathway survivability, and it may or may not define the level of pathway survivability required. As an owner, I might be concerned about that, and I may want to impose some additional requirements above and beyond the code as it relates to intelligibility or pathway survivability. 
There's a pending change, because we're not all the way through the process, for the next edition of NFPA 72 that will require pathway survivability to be identified on the design documents. So now at least the design professional is giving some consideration as to is pathway survivability required or what level of pathway survivability is required. So speaking of those documents, um, one of our objectives is to increase your awareness or familiarity with the requirements for the submittals, the documentation associated with fire alarm systems. And NFPA 72 now has a chapter, chapter seven, solely devoted to documentation. Now, some of those requirements apply to all projects. Many of those requirements will say where required by. So whether the code requires it, a permit process requires it, or the owner requires that level of documentation, NFPA 72 gives us the criteria, what should be in a set of design documents, or I've identified them as construction documents on the slide, or shop drawings, working drawings uh, for the system. This is not a complete list. But in essence, the design documents, the construction documents, are typically prepared by a design professional. I know instances where contractors do prepare them, and many states allow contractors to prepare them. Uh, but in essence, we're trying to identify the basic performance characteristics of this system, and we're, pri we're trying to provide enough detail that if the owner chooses to take this project and, and request bids from various contractors, the various contractors are going to be bidding the same type of system or a system with the same performance characteristics. And we don't have this situation, as I've seen on some unsuccessful projects, where, yes, we've got contractors with bids all over the place, and those bids really can't be compared to each other because there's so many differences with those systems. Now, once a contractor is selected, the contractor then gets into the detailed plans. As the design professional, I will identify the type of detection. I will, pretend, I will provide riser diagrams uh, with basic counts of devices, whether they're alarm notification appliances or initiating devices. But now the detailed shop drawings are going to provide the specific locations of those devices, the routing of the circuits of those devices, wire information. And earlier today, I was on a phone call talking about some, a problem project with some issues associated with design documents and shop drawings. And one of my questions to the folks involved is, doesn't this project require as-built drawings? And the PA 72 does. So ultimately, this development of this documentation, starting from the design documents, going to the shop drawing submittals, leads us down the path of having a good set of as-built drawings at the end of the project. Okay, sequence of operation, another requirement on the shop drawings. I, I don't know how anybody can test whether we're talking about acceptance test or periodic testing of a fire alarm system without giving or being able to reference this sequence of operations. Yeah, there are code requirements and requirements in NFPA 72, and Ray has talked about some of those that say, if this happens, this device goes into alarm, this is what should be the outcome of that alarm. But again, the owner may have some other requirements. We as a design professional may have some other recommendations. That all needs to be properly documented first in the design documents and then updated, as the slide says, as we get to the uh, shop drawings. Now, Kind of winding down and, and leading into our question period, what are some of the common mistakes that we sometimes see on projects? One is lack of proper planning. So you happen to see what's generally referred to as a life safety drawing for a hospital. Um, I've been involved in a project where the design of the fire alarm system did not coincide with the smoke barriers that were provided by the architect. The layout of the sprinkler system, therefore the zoning or the water flow switch alarm did not coincide with those smoke barriers. And the facility had to undergo a good bit of 
expense post occupancy so that the emergency plan that they had prepared for this facility which isn't always available to us as design professionals that that emergency plan would work so that they could notify occupants by smoke compartment that they could do things by smoke compartment and again their sprinkler system was arranged so that they would get their water flow alarms by smoke compartment inadequate or improper consideration of integration with other building or fire safety systems uh, we, there was a large we don't have a lot of large healthcare fires in the u.s there was a fire in the kingdom of saudi arabia a couple of years ago where 25 people died in a hospital fire one of the things that did not happen is that the air handling system and they had a return air plenum and the fire was in the return air plenum the air handling system did not shut down and as best we can tell it was never properly tested to verify that they would have the shutdown the smoke detectors were there the air handler capability was there but it was never connected so the question is who's responsible for that design who's responsible for that integration of that system uh, integration of our fire alarm system with other systems and on this slide I'm going to focus on the smoke control uh, so we may have multiple smoke control systems that's what's really shown in that fairly small graphic but also the interface of my smoke control system with the building HVAC system how does that occur what is the role of the fire alarm system in that integration whether it's a communication with a building management system or are those controls provided within the fire alarm system itself security is another one where i often see uh not the, the fire alarm system and the security system are not properly integrated to meet the life safety code requirements or the building code requirements for egress uh, consideration of selection of equipment but here we have an atrium and historically people would locate spot type detectors at the top of this atrium and then we asked the question well how are we supposed to inspect test and maintain those smoke detectors in accordance with chapter 14 of nfpa 72. so again as design professionals we need to make sure we should give consideration to inspection test and maintenance requirements as we prepare our design documents Ray talked about intelligibility. I won't go into any more detail on that, but you know the, the, the standard approach of putting a minimum number of devices in the building, and it happens to meet my audibility requirement, isn't necessarily going to result in good intelligibility of the system. Are we putting the correct devices in those locations? Now we have a question that's gonna come up that we will hopefully get to that talks about heat detectors. This is actually in a hospital. It is protected throughout with a sprinkler system. And if you look towards the back of this room, which happens to be a, a, a janitor closet type room, there's a smoke detector. Well, also almost directly underneath that smoke detector is a hot water dispenser. So people are coming into this room. You can see the self-closing device on the door. They're coming in with a large bucket. They want to put hot water in there. The next thing we know, we have steam in this room. This particular hospital was experiencing up to 30 nuisance alarms a month because of the, some of the choices that were made with the equipment that was installed. Again, Ray has talked about survivability, so I won't go into that. So let me end with, with this slide. Uh, and that is, no matter how good our design is, no matter how good the shop drawings are and the installing contractor, ultimately it's going to come down to, are we properly doing our acceptance test and are we properly commissioning these systems? So NFPA 3 and NFPA 4 are relatively new documents in the NFPA system. Uh, NFPA 3 and 4 are now being referenced in newer editions of our fire codes and our, the life safety code. And they basically talk about integrated fire protection systems and how we are to test those systems, not only for commissioning, NFPA 3, but NFPA 4 also gets into uh, periodic testing of the integrated system that we want to make sure at some frequency 
that that smoke detector that's supposed to recall the elevator actually does recall the elevator as compared to, yes, it, it sends a signal to the panel, which sends a signal to a control module. We know the fire alarm aspects of it work, but we don't know that we actually recall uh, the elevator. And then I could come up with a good slide or photo of a fire alarm device, but just calling your attention on the right-hand side of that slide, that might look to you like a legitimate sprinkler, but it's actually a counterfeit sprinkler. So again, through our acceptance test and construction period services, we need to make sure that the equipment is the proper equipment, it's listed where it needs to be listed, and it's installed in accordance with the standard and the manufacturer's instructions. And with that, Amara, I'll turn it back over to you for questions. All right, awesome information. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Bill. That was terrific. And as a reminder, you may earn one AIA CES approved learning unit or health safety and welfare unit for this event. You do need to pass a 10 question exam to take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES certificate. Use the learning unit exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a new browser window. You can complete the exam after this webcast ends. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off, so please open it now. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website with the archived version of this webcast. And before we get to the Q&A, I wanted to let you know about another opportunity to earn more continuing education on CFE-EDU, an interactive educational platform. You can register for several different courses from arc flash mitigation to data centers to electrical and power topics. Click on the link on the downloadable PDF to get to any of these CFE-EDU courses. All right, Ray and Bill will now answer questions about this topic. Please type your questions in the Ask a Question box on your screen, typing the presenter's name before your question so that I know who should answer it. We'll get to as many questions as time allows, and additional information will be posted online at www.csemag.com with the archived version of this webcast. All right, let's get started. Ray, you have the first question, and this one is about intelligibility. How do you determine what intelligibility is obtainable? Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure, sure. So uh, intelligibility, as I mentioned, under NFA 72 is not required to be quantifiably measured. Okay, so there, are, there is equipment out there that you can do quantifiable measurement with. Now, typically, if you have a space that has uh, uh, generally reasonable acoustical characteristics, so you have carpeting, you have uh, acoustical ceiling tiles, um, you have furniture in the space. Uh, what was shown in the original research during the development of the intelligibility requirements was that if you were meeting audibility levels, you would typically meet intelligibility levels, and I've seen that proven out in uh, testing. Now, where you have very difficult, uh, the difficult environments are those that have hard surfaces, so, uh, you know, terrazzo floors, uh, marble floors, a lot of glass uh, walls or hard surfaces, such as uh, in, a, uh, in the lobby of a Class A office building or in uh, a parking garage setting, for instance those areas would be extremely difficult to measure quantifiable intelligibility. Now, as a person walks through that space, they will be going in and out of the, uh, the field of the distribution of a speaker. They should be able to hopefully understand that message. And again, uh, that message is also being um, repeated so that uh, you know, a, a person has the opportunity to move towards a speaker uh, to uh, get the message. But again, if you have very difficult acoustical characteristics, then uh, the code does allow the use of other types of speakers that are designed for those types of spaces. Uh, the challenge we have been having in some facilities is uh, you know, getting the authority having jurisdiction to understand that the code does allow that type of uh, approach to improve intelligibility. Uh, and uh, the manufacturers are coming along with, uh, with better equipment to address that as well. 
Okay, very good, thank you. Bill, the next question is for you. What are the best methods to incorporate non-fire mass notification systems? So we're talking about maybe active shooters. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, and thanks for the question. It's very timely with some of the things that have been going on. Uh, we've been hearing uh, a number of jurisdictions or state legislatures that are thinking about relaxing the requirements for fire alarm systems in schools because the role the fire alarm system may have you played in this active shooter incident. Uh, my perspective is slightly different. And you know, Ray talked about mass notification. That's a perfect example where mass notification capability could be implemented in that school. And as much as Ray talked about new fire alarm systems being installed, there's nothing that precludes one from doing that same risk analysis in an existing building to determine if mass notification may be appropriate. Uh, NFPA 72 is very clear that mass notification takes priority over a fire alarm signal. Now, in terms of incorporating it in that existing building, a current edition of NFPA 72 allows me to use a control unit that's listed for mass notification or a control unit that's listed for fire alarm. So I could potentially, depending upon the capability of that system, use an existing fire alarm panel to provide mass notification capability. My risk analysis will indicate that there are some performance provisions of Chapter 24 that the fire alarm system may not meet and I can address those through that risk assessment. So what is the, the best way to do it? Uh, it may be to look at the existing fire alarm system and determining whether we can use that to meet our needs for mass notification. Okay, good information, thank you. Ray, the next question is for you. What has been done to meet NFPA 72 requirements for low frequency alarms for single or multi-station smoke alarms? Okay, sure. So, so that question arises from the requirements that sleeping areas uh, in buildings be uh, provided with low frequency alarms, low, so low frequency notification. And uh, there, there are currently uh, no single or multiple station smoke alarms that actually provide a low frequency signal. Now, in order to, uh, prov uh, in 72, chapter 29, which deals with sing uh, household fire warning systems, that chapter does not explicitly require low frequency signals. Uh, it only, uh, it, it addresses it in the way that if uh, you have occupants that are uh, hearing impaired or partially hearing impaired, that they should they should uh, in, uh, provide notification for those occupants, but very difficult to enforce. But if you're dealing with a apartment building or a hotel where you have sleeping areas uh, in an overall building fire alarm system, generally it is requiring that sounder bases, low frequency sounder bases, be installed within the units, so that when the smoke detector within that space activates, it causes the low frequency sounder within those units, or if there's more than one sounder, they would all activate within that unit to notify the occupants of either that hotel room or apartment. Um, so that's typically how it's being performed right now. Thank you, got it. Bill, we have time for just one last question and it goes to you. Uh, you touched on this a bit, but what is the general rule to use heat detectors? I actually saw this question pop up uh, before I started my presentation. So I somewhat set up the answer as I was talking about that janitor's closet in the hospital. But the general rule of thumb is where the code requires detection. It is referring to automatic smoke detection. There are provisions in most codes and in NFPA 72 that will talk about if smoke detection is not appropriate for the environment or because of the potential for nuisance alarms, that heat detection may be an acceptable alternative. 
may or may not require approval of the authority having jurisdiction. So in that photograph, where we had the smoke detector directly above that sink, an option might have been to put a heat detector there instead of a smoke detector. Personally, since it's not a patient sleeping room, it's not a patient treatment room, it has a self-closing device on the door, there's a sprinkler in there, so it already has a heat detector, I don't know that an additional detector was required. But to the extent that the AHJ required a detector in the room, a heat detector would have been appropriate. So in summary, we use heat detection primarily where the smoke detector is not going to serve the purpose or we have another objective. So if I can just squeeze this in, I'm aware of some multifamily, non-sprinkled residential occupancies in New England where the authority having jurisdiction has required the smoke alarms for life safety and then required heat detectors to transmit an alarm to the fire department so that they can be dispatched to that incident. Okay. Thanks, Bill. I'd like to close by thanking our brilliant speakers, Ray Grill and Bill Koppel, for sharing their extensive knowledge and understanding of notification and communication systems. And I'd also like to extend a special thank you to our sponsor, Edwards, for supporting today's webcast. The technical portion of this webcast is done, and we want to hear about what you thought about this education session. A short survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it. We use this information to improve future education. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer and CFE Media, thanks for attending this webcast. This now concludes today's event. Thank you for joining us and goodbye.